Well, hello all, Game Methuselah. Welcome to 2019. I hope you guys all had a great holiday for whatever you celebrate. I hope you got a chance to get together with family and play some games, which really are the two most important things. If you eat a little bit, well, that's good too. I wanted to start the year out um, with a minimalist game master uh, video. Since I tend to like to talk sort of more in the broad strokes of how you DM and not get into the minutia and detail uh, on the YouTube video. But I wanted to show you the secrets of Minimalist Game Master and I thought I would lay it out basically in a more detailed format so that hopefully you can see what I do. And if you like it, you can utilize it. And if you don't like it, you'll understand why. And you can toss it in the garbage and go on doing whatever else you're doing. And hopefully that's working really well for you. This has been servicing me well for four decades and, well, gosh, over four decades. And I think it should help you really well. And the secret of the Minimalist Game Master, like I said in my first video, is preparation. It's being prepared so that at a moment's notice, you're ready to step up and run an adventure. More importantly, as you do this, you sort of like going to the gym mentally for gaming. You learn how to do it so that, as Matt and I talked about in the original video he interviewed me on, how I could run adventures with nothing. Just, here's the concept, we're going down this rabbit hole, and I can follow along. And it's not that hard once you understand what you're doing. But again, the secret is always some sort of preparation ahead of time. So that when you are called upon to sort of step up and run a game at the last minute, you can seem really brilliant that you have all this preparation ahead of time. And when you run it, people will know that half the time you're just pulling it out of thin air. So here's what I do. First of all, this is what I suggest you buy from your for your beginning players. A notepad and a pencil. As you've heard, I found that most of the time players don't often even own a pencil. So a notepad to keep down all kinds of secret things. They can roll up their character on it and then decide whether they want to keep it. They can put down the names of the people you find and the important things and the name of the city and the name of the monsters and all that and alike. And that way in the future, it sort of becomes a running logbook of their adventure. And I think they'll appreciate it and they'll get more into the game. These things are cheap. You buy a big bag of these little mechanical pencils and it's great. You give them one of each and you say, okay, you have a pencil and you have your notebook. You're ready to go. The second thing I always suggest is as you play a while, you will accumulate lots of polyhedral dice. I have tons of them. I buy over the decades, having had a game shop, I've accumulated tons. I have Tons and tons, most of which never see the light of day. So I put together these little sets and stick them in a bag. That way, when the people show up, and of course they don't have dice, you can give them a set of dice of yours to use. Now, if you're really benevolent, you can actually let them keep it, um, and then you'll be rid of it, and you won't have it taking up dusty space in your household. Always a plus for me. But normally they're going to want to buy their own cool colored dice. And the newer dice are really pretty. And they're not going to want those ugly sort of magenta and off green dice that you give them to use. They're going to want something kind of cool and slick. And there's a lot of nice dice out there. So you'll drag them into the hobby. Miniatures, of course, you know, are always a plus for me, but not necessarily have to be for you. The second thing you want to get right off the bat is a three ring binder. Now, the big thing about the three-ring binder, and I will take pictures and, and lay this out afterwards so I can let you see some of this stuff close up, is it allows you to draw maps and have charts and dungeons, and you can just keep them. And some of these dungeons will get recirculated and reused over and over and over again because they're there. Now, eight and a half and 11, very standard. That's what I suggest you have. I have multiples of them I use depending on the game. I have one for Empire of the Petal Throne. I have one for D&D Zero. I have one for currently D&D Fifth Edition. And then I have one that's just all the maps I've used somewhat recently that get shoved into this little collection that sometime in the future, when people forget about them, I can recycle them. But you get the idea. Now, the other thing I do is I share them with people and I give them to people. And my friend Don and I, we share maps back. And if anybody ever runs a game and they have a map that they've done an adventure, 
I always love to get it because that's a new map I don't have to draw. I, I fall upon all kinds of other things. You know, I use, uh, as you know, I don't really run modules, even though a lot of people keep asking me which my favorite modules are. But I do draw from them occasionally for inspiration. I will use maps from them. I'll use ideas from them. And that's beneficial. The other thing you need to get, and this is the all crucial, the three by five box with three by five cards. Now, you can get a bigger one. I believe they make bigger ones, but they don't carry around as well, and I don't like them. I find everything you need can be kept in a three by five box. And what's nice about this when I show it to you, I have dungeons, I have characters, I have monsters. I have treasure items. I have everything in this 3x5 box. There's more likely a dozen adventures in here. Lots of characters I've generated, so if someone shows up and they want to play, they don't have a character, I can just give them one if they want to start out immediately. Something else that I think you should try to find. Now, they've discontinued these. These are all in the painted D&D um, &D lines of pre-painted miniatures that you could buy for third edition and fourth edition. They did these cards that were sent along with the miniatures that you got randomly in your packs. Now, they're not doing it in fifth edition, and I don't think they did it in the Pathfinder series either, which was a disappointment to me because I like them because it gave you all the information on a card that told you what the creature did out of the monster manual. The great thing about it is that you can just take it and look at it, and you can then understand what is important to have on a card. So you can then just take a 3 by 5 card like I do all the time, and you just write the statistics down. You'll have it. So this Dryad, I think you might have seen it in one of my other videos, even though just a basic Dryad was a boss monster in a first level adventure I ran. You know what statistics you want. Now, some of this is kind of a little outdated because I was using fourth edition I saving throw mods, which really don't exist um, in fifth edition. Fifth edition is pretty clean. The more I play it, the more I like it. I still pine for my fourth edition, which I think you guys know I loved, but I don't think it's coming back soon. And as time goes on, fewer and fewer people are interested in playing it. Yeah, three by five boxes are easy to get. Sometimes you even find really cool ones. I got this one at an estate sale about five or six years ago where somebody had hand painted this wooden box. Now I really just use it for storage of my multiple colored three by five cards and map cards and everything else. But it it's a little big and a little showy for me to carry around. So I'm gonna save it till I do some live streaming and then you'll get to see it when I do one of my dog and pony shows of sort of pulling an adventure out of my posterior and just running it off the top of my head. So, I'll, and it was a lot of fun. And basically what I did is somebody showed up, he had hand painted this map, which was beautiful. He gave it to me, which I really loved. And he told me what the background was. So I used his background and his map, and I whipped up a concept for an adventure, used all uh, miniatures that were from the 75, 76 era, plus hand-drawn maps that Steve had drawn and some other things, and just a big old board and a grease pencil. That's what was available at the time, and we had a great time playing the game. I really, really enjoyed it. I think the people involved really enjoyed it as well. So, you know, I'll do that again in the future here. The other thing after that is, is people talk about modules. Now, I think modules are fine. Um, you can go out and buy them. I pick up things when they're on discount, and I pick up a lot of different modules, and they're giving them away. And I read them for inspiration. And occasionally, they'll have a map in it that I might want to use. They have a new monster or something like that, which is very cool. And then they have some neat ideas and say, hey, I'm going to steal that. And then the rest of it, I go, yeah, I don't care. And I just dump it. And I make my own adventure. Now, I may take this concept and go with it and then build upon it and make my own creations and fit it into the campaigns. And that's what I suggest you do. Now, if you're going to use a module and you like it, do so. I understand. Now, the problem you always have to remember is if you're playing with veteran players, a lot of them might have already played or read or owned the adventure. Now, Craig is running a 5th edition reskinned uh, Pathfinder uh, campaign, which I own, uh, never read, because it had come to me as a gift. Uh, 
as I was looking through it, thinking I was going to throw it on eBay, I kind of read the, the beginning and said, hey, hey, this is Craig's campaign. Now, he's doing a great job reskinning it to fifth edition, making his own modifications. So it's a nice thing. And I quickly sold it on eBay for cheap so that somebody else could enjoy it and I wouldn't get any of the secrets and thusly lose the fun of playing the game. Now, something I purchased just recently uh, based upon Matt's recommendation is this. Now, at first, I was kind of unimpressed when I opened it. You know, Volo's Guide to Monsters. It had some neat monsters in it. Uh, some that had already been out, but weren't in the new 5th edition DMGs that I really, really like. Some little demons that I have plenty of miniatures of that I really, really like. And I love throwing low-level ethereal, uh, demonic creatures in there to get that color going, to get that campaign feel going. And... I started to flip through it and go, yeah, okay, okay, Dara Giants, Beholders, you know, Knoll Lairs. And then I started reading them and I went, wait a minute, they've given you a dozen different adventures. They got a Beholder Lair, and a Giant Lair, Knoll Lair, Cobalt Lair, Orc and Goblin Lair, Yuante. They've got everything, all these little adventures that you can pick and choose and use. But the nice thing about them is you can take one of them and make it your big bad guy. There's a Mind Flayer lair. I love Mind Flayers. I think they're great for bad guys. The Beholder, you know, I mean, they, they give you a lot of interesting things. And based upon what type of Beholder you get, you get a different campaign flavor. So you could have a whole thing where there's a Beholder. Nobody knows anything about it, what kind it is. So half the adventure is trying to maybe figure out what's going on based upon what minions, what bosses, what other types of creatures are sent against you by this Beholder Overlord. Great bad guys. You've more than likely got a dozen link-ups for great campaigns that you can start, run, add your own pieces around it, and you will have a tremendous game just based upon the fact of what the big boss is at the end. And that's often very much all you need. You know, people sometimes overthink their campaigns and they overthink their adventures and they make them very big and complicated and they don't put them into bite-sized pieces that people can sit down on an evening and play. That's really it. Use the maps that are there. Use the pieces that are there. I've harped on this before. Run games and other people's campaigns to include things because usually what happens to the great sadness of my playing is most campaigns just peter out. Maria ran a really great uh, Greek mythos campaign, and it was eight adventures, and we knew this going on. It was one big mission working for Zeus to try to recover this major artifact before the bad guys did, because it was going to change the whole balance of the gods. It was a major, major quest, but it was really brought up into a situation that we knew it was a limited number of ventures. The characters played, they were powerful to begin with, more powerful as they went on, and at the end they had big things to fight, and it was a great adventure. When we finished, we had our dealings with the gods, and it was very satisfying. The game ended, it had lasted about three months, and we all had a great time. Now the neat thing about it is, one time when she was sick, Don was able to throw in this little side adventure, because he's big into Greek mythology, and add it into her campaign, and it worked perfectly, and it helped drive her story. That's what I talk about when you have multiple game masters being able to help you in a campaign, who can step up and fill in and do something interesting. You can do a lot with very minimalist stuff, but the secret is to be prepared. And when you're prepared, the idea is you can run into a random encounter. You have NPCs, bosses drawn. You have NPC monsters drawn. You have moths, all the monsters written up. Now, I used to carry two giant toolboxes, like 900 miniatures to every campaign, because I wanted to be ready for anything. Well, that seems dumb. Now I figured out that a really tiny toolbox that'll carry about 100 miniatures is really all I need. I know what characters are being played. I bring a few extras for NPCs. And I know what monsters are going to come up, both in the random encounters and in the fixed encounters. And that's all you need to do for miniatures. You bring your board, in my case, dungeon tiles, or if you know the players you're going to have, have tactiles or maps or things you can use. You utilize their facility. Makes it easier, as now that I've gotten older, I don't like carrying hundreds of pounds of miniatures around. Keep it simple. 
keep it in a very bite-sized piece. I'll show you now how I do it bit by bit and how I think it'll help you. And maybe it'll work. Give it a try. But understand anything. This is how you do it simply. It's a lot of things that they do even in Adventure League. They've now quantified Adventure League things down to basically three encounters. You have three encounters and a little bit of color, and that is what can fit in a three-hour slot. Uh, in a sit down at a hobby shop or a game convention and play. That's a good formula uh, for most role playing games. A lot of times when you have dungeon slogs, you don't know how long they're going to go. You have level after level of rooms and they may go on forever, but they make for interesting deals. But in stories like a little campaign, you want five or six rooms, maybe two different locations and a couple you know, really epic fights, maybe one small NPC encounter or something in between, but you don't want to drag your game on to be so long that it becomes ponderous, that the players can't necessarily follow it or become lost or disinterested. And you always want to keep that theme, that drama, that thing driving the story, that there's something out there that's important. You lay that out early and you keep on it. You know, the players can go left and right and they have side adventures and all that. But when it all comes down to it, you want to keep your main thrust of your story down and try to make it so there's always, maybe say every three months or even every two months, there's a build culmination of defeating some boss, a lower level boss at the beginning, obviously that leads to some thing where you find out oh he was just a minion of some bigger boss maybe the beholder maybe the giant maybe something you've read in that D, D module you know you'd find the concept you want to use and then you work with it but all of that can be very simple in your campaign it's bite size it's easy it's fast and once again it's minimalist you're prepared you don't know when you can jump in, but somebody's running a the game. They say, hey, you know, can you run one another, one of your little pieces? And it's like, great, boom, I'm ready. The idea is be prepared, have it organized, have it with you, and suddenly you can spring it out and look brilliant. So I'm going to turn the camera around and show you a little bit of detail of some of the things I've drawn so that you can see it. I've done things like this on Twitter, too. So if you follow me on Twitter, um, you can see some things that I've done of old maps I did from the 70s and things like that. Until I have a chance to talk to you again, fight me, devils fight, for I hate peace. Stick around, I'll try to show you some more detail pieces, and game on, and welcome to 2019. Now here's what I said, the standard thing you start with is a three-ring binder. Now this is all sort of based upon my Twilight of Fae campaign, where you see that this is obviously ancient Celtic England, and it shows the various clans and factions that existed. Something that's really good to do is I write down the names of people that they could run into. I was notoriously bad at that. Matt used to always call me on the carpet that I never had names for all these people that I suddenly made up on the fly. So I figured the easiest way to do that is just have a whole list of names. And as I use them, I scratch them off and then someone else can, you know, use them on after that. Again, more maps, letters from bad guys to player characters. Old dungeons, these are great. The whole thing to have with old dungeons, now this dungeon here is from the 70s. This is one of the ones I put on Twitter. I just happen to have it in here. I think it's very cool. Um, the map is more than likely well over 40 years. You can sure tell by the yellowed edges and stuff. It's kind of interesting. But the great thing, again, is you can see more dungeons, some old, some more modern, is that you get to use them and then eventually you can reuse them over and over again. It's always good to keep things. Little villages and stuff. You can find things online. They're really great to have. Sometimes your friends draw undergrounds and dungeons or things and then you can steal them and use them. And that's really neat. This is actually a map from Albion. Picture of a Celtic village. This is all color. This is from the game which I love, and I, I use the concepts a lot. But of course, as we get into this, I have to make my own. I utilized the town and changed it over to one of the towns that was in my game. I had different things on what was in the town. You know, all the things you would normally do. Locations and things like that. Gather these things up and put them in to a three ring and just keep them. You never know what you're going to use. And if friends of yours will give you maps, it really benefits. Another one drawn by Dawn. I've then changed it around and done other things with it. 
Again, more maps, different deals, and you keep up with that. And this is what happens. You build over the period of time all kinds of little things that at a moment's notice you can pull out and use. Somebody's Matt Coville's player character from our game. A little castle map that I found that's scaled to the miniatures. The next thing is the 3x5 card box. Now, this is really important. As I showed you this really cool one that I like, the only problem is the lid sits completely flat which means if I draw a dungeon, I'm going to have to put it on an angle like this, and it can slide or fall off a little easier. And I don't think I'll use it unless I do some live streaming and I'm just going to want a cute, really cool prop. This is my old standby. This box is very old, and I've used it. Now, these are various dungeons. Now, this is a mainstay car box. As you can see, it has adventures. Now, I'd already pulled this one out of my adventure thing to show you. But then you have old adventures, many, many, many of them that you draw. Now, I always drew them on these little 3 by 5 cards, and I made them because they would use to match my movement tray. So I could use my miniatures, and I could have all my dungeons drawn that would fit perfectly on the little mat I had to utilize. Unfortunately, the players all wised up to that, and they eventually realized that if they were on the map and suddenly there was an area of the map that was blank, there had to be some sort of secret door and they would figure out how to game that. Not so great, so I had to change it around a bit. Now, the neat thing about it is I got lots of stuff here for the fantasy trip, which you know I like, um, and different things. But I drop NPCs. I keep them evil NPCs. You know, there's a third level ogre monk. I think I showed him to you earlier in, a, in an adventure. You just find things. There's a lot of times people will give me characters to hold on to so that they're playing in my game. They don't want to have the character. They always want to make sure they have it if we play. So they'll leave it with me. Sometimes I just generate characters in case somebody shows up and they want to play, but they don't have a character ready. Again, and then there are all kinds of creatures. You know, you put them on three by five cards and you have them ready to go when the time comes. A lot of these things, like I said, you've seen, dryads, oh, my all favorite sturgy, that I can just pull them out and use them. Now, you pull out an evil NPC, you pull out a monster, and now you have a random encounter really easily. You have magical items that maybe you're drawn up or that you have a list of things that they can find so that when you generate creatures, you just have magic to give them. So they find this, they defeat this monster, they find this, this item. And as you use the maps, you can put them on the back. Now, always want to keep lots of little blank cards. I love these multicolored 3x5 cards. They're great for characters. They're also great for different types of creatures like goblins goblins and orcs I put on green, demons and, and uh, devils I'll put on red, and, and that way, you know, monsters I'll put on yellow, and that way there's a color code system, so when you're flipping through your box to be fast here, you can find it really easy. This has been one of my major secrets for 40 years, is that I have all this stuff hanging around, and it's sometimes very old. Now, once the players realize my evil strategy, that I had the, the map, I had to change it around. So this is sort of where it came to. This is a little gnomish ruin I made, a little adventure, where the orcs have been camped outside and they're trying to find out what the secret is in this gnomish ruin. So you can either sneak by or battle the orcs, which would be very difficult because they're such a very large contingent. But if you do, there's the ruin, and as you search around, you find this stairwell descending into a trapped room. And as you can see, the pit traps and this little crossbow trap, and there's dead bodies in the thing and the like. And then there's a door, and the door leads down here to these little gargoyle statues and another pit. And the gargoyle statues are just that, nothing fancy, but they're there to spook the players and get them going. Now there's always going through here, you find another pit, and this is a dice. There's a secret door that it's very difficult to find, but it leads down into the dungeon. Other than that, there's a standard stairwell, which is the way you sort of plan they're going to go. And then there's just a room full of crypts that once again are creepy, but nothing interesting. You go down to the next level, and here are the things here. You're going down, you can hear, now suddenly there's Dobish skeletons that leap up from the bodies and attack the players. There's even if they find it, and with the DC-25, hopefully they will not, there's a gnomish lich lair. Now, he can be a little weaker, depending on the level of your party, and if they even have a hope in hell of finding it. But that's up to you. Um, but it also makes for a lot of interesting color in the future, because if they come back to this mine dungeon again in the future, they're going to always wonder why there's so many undeads, and that's why. Again, lower levels of descending. You've got different things, monsters, 
different, just different rooms with different special abilities and stuff. And the nice thing about it is once you build on these things, you can use them in the future for, for, you know, other things. As you see, as it gets lower and lower, you get a little less intense because it becomes more of the mine. And the actual bottom level, of course, is the mine. And if they get down there and they defeated all the bad guys and they've cleaned the dungeon out, they now have acquired this place where they can get gems and high-grade ore, including some mithril. So if you're playing more of the army game towards the future, this becomes really, really beneficial. Now, you can change this up. You can run it straight this way one time. After the players have played it, if it doesn't become theirs, you can just put it in your plan box. And five years from now, you come out and you make it something entirely different. You change up all the monsters, but you have the map. You don't have to draw it. It could be even the same place. You could go with the same theme. You could find out there there was once a lich there, maybe still there. Oh, but he was murdered by some adventurers, but maybe he wasn't. In, uh you have monsters, you have them all ready to go. And this goes on and on and on. And the thing too to do is, again, eventually you learn what stats are important to have on a car. Now, if you use modules, of course, they're gonna give you all that in the module and it's gonna make it pretty easy for you. So it shouldn't be a problem. Well, all, I hope that was a little bit helpful for you. Um, you know, I don't want you to change what you're doing, but I want you to give some thought to really try and prepare a lot of your own adventures. The biggest reason I never use modules is that they take so much longer to really get them down to play than I ever found by preparing my own. Because again, like I said, when you prepare your own, you really got it down pat. It's in your mind. You know what it looks like and feels like and, and, and how it's going to play. When a module, half the time, if you miss something or you skim something and then you come back later, you find out, oh my gosh, I forgot the most important part. Never happens when it's your module. You always know what you're going to do. And the players don't. They can't outfox you by reading the module and knowing what the bad guy is going to do because they have no idea who the bad guy is until you reveal it. When you find something you like, there's a theme you like, steal it. Now, Matt did that, um, I think, on the Borderland with uh, Colorado the Vile, where he just stole the character sort of out of the book and then ran with it and made him his own bad guy. And that's perfectly good. That's all part of the minimalist thing. You know, I'm not saying don't buy this stuff. It's great stuff. It'll give you tons and tons of ideas, just like that one module did with, God, all these different monster layers, which are fabulous and very useful. So, you know, buy the stuff, read the stuff, but don't make it gospel and don't make it rigid. Flow with it. Let it fit into your game. Add new stuff. Change it around. You know, add a left turn, add a right turn so people won't know what's going on. Change the big bad guy. Pull a bad guy from one module, bring him over and make him the bad guy in this module. Surprise all the people who think they're so sly because, oh, I know what module you're playing, so I know who the bad guy is. Nah, no, 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 no. It'll always be different when it's yours. And it should be because it, you want to have that reveal and excitement and drama and enjoyment that the players get out of being in your game, running the thing that you love and the games that are going to be so much better when they understand that it's your adventure and not some, you know, cookie cutter type thing that everybody in his dog has run at one point in time. So again, I think I've already said goodbye, fight me devils and all that. So enjoy 2019, get some good gaming in, Paint some miniatures and game on.